Have you ever woken up with a question in your heart and you're not sure whether you had that thought or whether God planted it? Well, I had this question the other day when I woke up. What made John the apostle? I mean, what transformed this man into the one to whom Jesus entrusted the book of Revelation? Let's do a little bit of a history lesson. When we first encounter John in Mark 10, 34. He's fishing with James and their father, just doing the family thing. At a simple invitation by a man they hardly knew, James and John left from their boat, waved goodbye to their father, and off they went on a grand adventure, never looking back. And we get a further insight into John's impulsiveness and a bit of a hot-headed temperament through the nickname that Jesus gave them both, the Sons of Thunder, in Mark 3, verse 17. And we see James and John's bent towards ambitious goals when they did not stop their mother from asking their rabbi for the most prestigious seats of power for her boys in anticipation of Jesus making his move to overthrow their oppressors. I dare you to read Matthew 20, verse 20 to 28 without cringing just a wee bit. Many scholars know that John lived to the ripe old age of at least 90, which was very old in his day. All his fellow disciples, the men that Jesus and John ran with, died horrible deaths long before John died a peaceful one. His own brother, James, was one of the first martyrs within that close-knit cluster of disciples thrown from a high tower. Can you imagine the trauma and grief that John had at that news? His brother, can you imagine? You know, when we read Bible accounts, we somehow detach Im the emotions of the people we are reading about. But the trauma and the grief that the apostles went through being beaten and tortured and thrown into prison and seeing so many people they love being killed must have had some sort of trauma within their hearts. Fox's Books of Martyrs writes that John was thrown into a vat of boiling oil and came out unscathed, at least in his body. I can only imagine the scars that were left on his soul. So what was the secret to John's longevity? Why didn't he turn away? Why didn't he become bitter? What marked him? When he was released from exile, why didn't he just quietly disappear? Was it that dramatic encounter on the Mount of Transfiguration found in Matthew 17, verse 1 to 8? I'm not discounting the impact that fear of the Lord face planted in the ground experience must have had on John. That encounter actually set John up for the encounter of a lifetime where in his elder years he received the vision written of in the book of Revelation. But I believe John's successful longevity in service to his beloved rabbi was due to his ability to lean into Jesus. Even the most oblivious disciple that night in Passover, in what we would call the Last Supper, even the most oblivious of them would have said something was slightly different about Jesus that night. After all, the Passover was greatly celebrated in Jesus' time. It was a joyous time. It was a sobering time, but there was joy in it. But they probably could sense Jesus was a little distracted. He had something on his mind. While the other disciples distracted themselves with conversations around the table, John chose to stay close. He leaned in. Now to set the scene, Jesus has just finished washing the disciples' feet and now invited them to the table. His first words were not the words you would expect from a host welcoming guests to celebrate the Passover. Let's start in John 13. We're going to be reading from verse 18 to 25. Jesus starts. This is his opening statement. 
around the Passover table. I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill the passage of scripture. He who shared my table has turned against me. I'm telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Verily, truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to his disciples and said, ask him which one he means. And so leaning back against Jesus, he, being John, asked him, Lord, who is it? John leaned back on the heart of Jesus. He must have done this before because brave and bold Peter knew that John had the open door to ask the question he dared not ask. For the briefest of moments, time stood still. I imagine all John heard was the beating of Jesus' heart as he leaned against his chest. The thump, the thump, the thump. That quiet moment and that oasis gave John the strength to endure seeing his beloved rabbi and friend suffer brutal torture, terrible crucifixion, and an undeserved shame-filled death when all the other disciples who were in that room fled. I've sat under the leadership of many successful pastors and leaders of mission organizations, small churches, mega churches, and home groups. They all gleaned from leaning into the heart of Jesus. They sought after that deep place of intimacy with the Lord. They fought for it and they stubbornly refused to change the message. They refused to change the subject. They sought after God with all of their heart and then led others to the God who welcomed them to lean against him. I recently came across this quote by Graham Cook and I think John would totally agree what with what Graham says here. It is absolutely essential that you are wounded in ministry and that you know the fellowship of his sufferings. It is such an essential part of the call that we get wounded in the house of our friends. We get wounded by the people that we really, really thought we could trust, that we feel that kiss of betrayal that Jesus felt in the garden. Being betrayed and wounded is, is just a part of your development. If you want the fullness of God, you have to experience all the fullness of life. If you want the power of his resurrection, you have to know the fellowship of his suffering. So when you know that it's part of your development, it's easier to forgive those people who have done things to you. Trials and traumas and betrayals will come to us because we are surrounded by people just like us. People sometimes make foolish choices, but we can endure, and not just endure to the end, but thrive to the end, if we embrace the secret of John's longevity in God's kingdom. I encourage you today, this very moment when you are watching this, enter that place of intimacy where the heartbeat of God becomes your most comforting sound as you lean into his strength, you will be able to lead others out of their chaos and uncertainty and into that same peaceful, quiet place, leaning into the heartbeat of Jesus. Father God, I pray for each person who's listening to my words right now who have been distracted by the chaos going on around them. 
where they have been distracted by other people's distractions. Father, help them to press against your son, to lean into that quiet place and that oasis, even in the midst of a swirl going around them, that they would take that moment to breathe in deeply. Because in that moment, they will receive the strength and the peace that they will need to carry on. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.